Fire in 2018 did, did um, uh, 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 that at uh, that stage an in-person seminar focusing on this issue of, of African agency um, in the face of Chinese power. Since then, it's it's a remarkable how the, the debate has evolved um, and you know how how new kind of data points around lending, for example, is simultaneously challenging what we think of as, as African agency and showing that African agency in relation to Chinese power is, is, is an evolving issue that we all that, that really demands more attention. So we decided to follow that up with, with this event in which we, we drill down into the concept in, in a lot more detail. Um, this is why we call it the fine print. Um, so we have two panels today. The first is, uh, is gonna focus on, I think the field of, of African agency that everyone has been focusing on, which is, uh, which is a government, governmental agency um, and the, the, the role of African, of African governments in, in, you know, kind of in dealing with, with their Chinese partners and in, in, you know, kind of making their own decisions within that relationship. Um, the second, the second session um, will focus on a different kind of agency, which which we have, um, you, you know, kind of as a kind of a, a, an initial kind of way of talking about it, we we defined as a social agency. So there, we talk a lot about how the the decisions made by African governments in relation to Chinese power, how they affect citizens on the ground and what kind of what, what what the role and the power of citizens are to to, to shape their destiny in, re, in relation to to cooperation with china so um i'm you know the, the that that's where we started and i'm gonna hand over to um to our distinguished speakers um in the next minute or so um just before that just um two small logistical issues uh, one is that unfortunately two of our respondents had to had to um kind of step out um at the last moment um unfortunately Funeka in april um from hsrc um she's dealing with her with a medical and family medical emergency today um so we're sending her strength we're very sad that she won't be able to join us today and um Vaini Naidu was unfortunately too too busy, like like in the end she had scheduling issues. Um, our um, my new colleague um, at SAI, Isabel Bosman, is going to step in for Vaini as a respondent. I'll step in for Yazimi. So our apologies for that. We're very sad to, to miss those two vital voices today. Um, then finally, we we all just we're going to put. Um, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a small um, survey into into the chat a little bit later for you to just give us kind of feedback on the event. Sai uses these to, to try and improve their events, and, um, uh, you know, kind of going into the future. So um, with no um, with no further further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Pilani Mtembu. Um, he's the executive director of the Institute for Global Dialogue at the University of South Africa. Um, and uh, yeah, we're very, very honored to have him. He's, he's, he's one of the most uh, prominent kind of spokespeople on, on Africa's external relations and also China-Africa relations. So it's, it's, a, it's fantastic to have him here today. Um, Pilani, please, please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Corbus. And, um, Thank you also to the South African Institute of International Affairs. Uh, <clears throat> I think really mine is to really highlight, um, well, to firstly commend the initiative because I think we do need to see more platforms, particularly from African institutions that are driving the debate and driving the agenda on African agency. Um, the second point is just for me to, to, to really emphasize on why it is important that we are having uh, these discussions, but mostly that they are led uh, by African institutions, but that they are led by African scholars, and then resonating out there in Europe, in Asia, in the United States, and in Latin America and everywhere else in the world, but that they are driven from an African uh, perspective. And I think this is really quite important because for many years, uh, international relations has tended to focus predominantly on the great powers and has tended to view the countries and the regions that those great powers are engaged in as essentially peripheral actors. 
Um, so when we think about China, for instance, if you read most of the literature, for many years, you read about China in Africa. Uh, you read about um, what are the implications for China engaging in Africa. And in a lot of that literature, it is almost as though there was no agency from the African stakeholders. And I'm glad that this uh, webinar is looking both at state actors, but it's also taking a broader perspective at some of the other actors engaged uh, within the African continent. So you're talking also of non-state actors. Mm -hmm. And I think this is quite important because what we've seen uh, from some of our observations in recent years is that there is a qualitative shift in the way that um, uh, China engages within the continent. Um, and and, and in, in, in sort of, you know, concretizing what I mean there, I think that China is realizing that there is a need to broaden the scope of engagement. So it is not only a state to state driven uh, partnership anymore. Uh, there is a very conscious attempt uh, from the Chinese stakeholders to not only encourage state-to-state -state relations, but to also encourage partnerships that go beyond the state. And I think this is quite important in sustaining the relationship in the longer term, um, because you are dealing in a continent with a whole range of voices. And it's important that whoever you are, whether it's China or any other external actor, that those voices are actually taken into account. Uh, what it does is it also ensures that you're able to sustain the relationship over a longer period of time. But at the same time, you're also able to have a better perception of what are some of the impressions on the continent from below, but also from above. And I think this is quite important moving forward. And I think really why it's important that it's African stakeholders that are leading some of these discussions is because if we go back, and it's an example I like to make, if we go back to the year 2000, uh, the Economist came out with an article and, a, and, a, and, a, and um, you know, a cover page which said essentially the hopeless continent. Now, whilst this was happening, um, at the same year, you had China essentially rolling out the red carpet for African stakeholders through the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. And why is that? It's because I think they, they them as a developing country, um, understood that there is opportunity in actually engaging with countries that are not necessarily as wealthy you know, as uh, developed countries, that there is actually economic, political, and social opportunity in being more strategically involved. And I think since that time, we have seen a greater emphasis on the African continent, not only from China, but from a whole range of stakeholders, whether it's Turkey, whether it's South Korea, whether it's the EU, whether it is the US, and a whole range of stakeholders that are interested in engaging with the continent through various uh, summit diplomacy uh, fora. And I think what has then become important is how does the African continent use that interest in order to achieve its own development objectives? And I think these are some of the questions you know, that uh, today's discussions will be going into. What are some of the opportunities for Africa in engaging with uh, China, especially as China engages in a, in a, in, in, in a new sort of um, uh, a, a period of its development trajectory? Uh, we know that uh, last year China declared uh, extreme poverty, um, you know, essentially history uh, in China. Um, 10 years ahead of the global goal uh, uh, of the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we know that there is the dual circulation um, phrase that is circulating. And the question is, how will African stakeholders engage with China? What opportunities will they see? 
but also what challenges will be identified that need to be addressed before they actually escalate uh, further. And so I'm encouraged every time I see African institutions focusing on the topic of African agency, because I do think that scholars, not only in Africa, but also outside of the continent, when they are doing their research on China's engagement in Africa, they also need to um, flip it around and ask, how is Africa engaging with China? What are Africa's interests in engaging with China? And in doing that, it's important for African stakeholders to not necessarily have their discourse driven from the outside, but it's important that they take a calculated analysis of where their particular interests are when it's, it comes to uh, China. My last point is to just you know, raise um, a sort of matter that we need to be observing closely as African researchers. And that is the recent um, uh, US Senate Foreign Relations Committee um, Strategic Competition Act of 2021. And what is really interesting with that, um, with that is that amongst other things is the US is proposing, um, you know, essentially channeling millions of dollars uh, towards a closer look at what China is um, uh, doing in other parts of the world. But what is interesting and intriguing is that essentially one could interpret it as almost providing uh, resources uh, towards covering what are some of the negative impacts of the Belt and Road Initiative, for instance. But lastly, what is interesting about this Strategic Competition Act from the US uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee is that it proposes a $300 million uh, fund uh, called Countering China's Influence Fund. Now, this is quite interesting for those actors on the African continent. And I think it really brings home the importance that discussions on China are driven from a calculation of Africa's interests in the world and not necessarily that Africa gets caught up in a competition amongst um, uh, uh, um, the US and China or any other uh, strategic actors. Because the reality is that Africa doesn't have the luxury to choose between the US, China, the EU and others. But what Africa does have the luxury is that it is being courted by a range of stakeholders. And if it works with them strategically and understands where its interests are and goes for those interests individually and collectively, then I do believe that African agency will actually be enhanced by the growing interest on the continent. And with those remarks, thank you again, uh, Kourbis. Thank you to the South African Institute of International Affairs. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Pilani. That's amazing. Um, so we were going to move with, without hesitation into the, into the first panel. Um, in this panel, we look at two of the most uh, controversial um, and I think interesting cases of, of the way that, that African governments have managed to, to balance the, the, the power deficit that they, that they have with China. Um, the, our first paper um, is by Johanna Malm. Um, now, Johanna has, has, has you know, kind of several affiliations, but she's joining us today as an independent researcher and as a, a member of the Stockholm Observatory for Global China. And she's going to be focusing on the Democrat, Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, Johanna, thanks so much. Thank you so much, Corbus. Um, and um, thank you also to Pilani for those amazing remarks. I'm just going to see um, if this is now working. Can you see my presentation? Uh, yes, it looks it looks good. Thank you. So the paper I, I published then with Sai as part of the broader like focus on agency um, within um, within Sia is entitled "China Powered Agency: African Agency and Its Limits." the case of the GRC 2007 to 2019. 
Um, so it came out in, in December. I'm so excited to be here today to present it a bit more. Um, so what is now China Powered African Agency? It's the term that I chose to use. Well, I started with um, a definition of agency as an actor's ability to make independent decisions and strengthen its bargaining power. And this is the dis definition that Corbus and, and colleagues used in a 2018 paper that started kind of um, Sayas' work on, on agency. Of course, this is a complicated issue theoretically. And because the, the paper that I present today, so policy insights, so it's not uh, theorizing the issue of agency and the structural like issues underlying it. I mean, I'm not in deep in a theoretical debate, but so that's basically the definition that I've used. What I mean by China powered agency is an agency that actually hinges on China's own strategic interests, which means, um, and this is the key argument that it's a circumscribed um, kind of agency. Um, so the key argument of the paper uh, is to show that there are two periods uh, during the overall period studied. So it's period one from 2007 to 2009, when China actually did provide the DRC with such uh, China powered agency in relation to its other development partners. Um, it, this means that it enabled Congo to secure a beneficial Chinese loan as well as a uh, hippic debt relief. Of course, now I talk about DR Congo as if it was a unity. Of course, it's an enormous country. Um, it's a very fragmentized political landscape. Um, this is the Kabila government that we talk about um, at this time. I will get back to that in a minute. Um, but in the upcoming, in the coming period, 2010 onwards, and until today, actually, there, there has been no such China powered agency because China's approach to the DRC changed. Um, so I think this is what I, when I started working on the people, this is the main thing I wanted to say, you know, to see that there's a difference between the periods, because I do think we have a tendency when we talk about China to say, ah, China provided the DRC with this kind of agency. That's the way it is. Whereas, no, it was that case. I mean, people do think about this, the, the situation that happened in 2007, 2009, and think, oh, that's the relation. But actually, the relation has changed, and it has changed quite a bit. So that's what I wanted to put forward in this paper. So just a um, brief overview of the relations between China and DR Congo. Uh, I can also discern two periods. In 1972, uh, when Zaire at the time recognized China, uh, I mean, at first China uh, at the time recognized Congo at independence, um, and then uh, DRC, uh, Zaire then, that, as it was called, recognized China. But from the period up until 2006, um, the engagement was quite limited because at first, of course, China was in the space that it was. It had not yet opened up. And once opening up started um, at the turn of the century, Congo was at war. Um, so there was limited engagement over this time. Some aid, I mean, the famous Stade de Martyr in Kinshasa and some hospital and and, and other these kind of symbolic things. Of course, some medical teams were around and of course that military training as well. So uh, Joseph Kabila, the president who left um, last, uh, last two years ago now, um, received military training in China in his youth, etc. So the bilateral ties were strong, but the engagement was quite limited. Of course, this is what, what uh, Chinese relations to many African countries were like um, during that period. But from 2007 onwards, relations were amplified because of, well, we should talk about the Sikumin Agreement. Um, but and I'm going to talk more about Sikumin in a bit. But just to set the stage where we are at this first period. So 2006, there were elections held with a big support from the international community. This was really to just try to stabilize the country. It's been an enormous and devastating war. Uh, Kabila was elected president and he was then in need to secure funds for post-conflict reconstruction also to kind of you know show some deliverables to the electorate. Rumor was, was then heard in 2007 that a kind of very big gigantic agreement with China has been signed but you know parliament didn't know <laughs> they were surprised. Line ministries, the ministry of infrastructure didn't know they were surprised. Everyone surprised. So and this was this became to, called les contrats chinois, so the Chinese contracts that becomes the talk of the town. And of course, everyone was upset um, because of the secrecy 
surrounding this. And before we talk more about the political controversy, I just want to um, speak a bit about the contract itself, Les Contrats Chinois, as it's called. Um, it was and is, of course, a new type of financing arrangement, which uh, has been called um, resources for infrastructure. I prefer to talk about it as a financing arrangement because it isn't a, a, a pure barter. It's an arrangement where profits from a mining project repays loans that were taken out. Uh, so one loan to fin finance infrastructure, kind of a public goods type infrastructure, roads and hospitals. And this was a credit line of maximum 6 billion that was talked about. I have analyzed these different amounts that were announced in depth. And Chinese, the Chinese never committed to dispersing 6 billion. This was talk of a credit line of maximum 6 billion. That's not the same as dispersing it, but this was very misunderstood, I think, in the, in the beginning. And another loan to finance a mining project in itself that would then um, generate revenues to pay back the loan. And that was a credit line of three billion. Also, again, it wasn't dispersed. That was just the maximum that was that was talked about at the time. Um, so during this period, the first period, um, there was a national controversy because, of course, parliament and civil society weren't happy that they hadn't been involved or that there was no consultation around this international controversy. And the international dimension was mainly because there was a huge clash between this and the debt relief process and the because the international donors, the big donors had invested a lot in in debt relief. <clears throat> this was seen as the main, you know, a very important route on a kind of stabilizing the Congo quest that the international community was at the most important part of the liberal peace paradigm that you want to stabilize the state and you run right off its debt. So this was like a uh, very like machinery running that we're going to cancel the debt and then comes this loan making it completely impossible for western creditors to forgive so much debt if congo was now just going to go straight ahead and contract that same amount of, of loans from china so this became a big um, controversy around that um, there's a big i can talk a lot about this controversy and the different nuances around this and and how it was settled but just move on. This is a quick version. So um, in 2009, there was an, uh, an agreement um, settled. Everyone you know, agreed to like uh, change the terms somewhat of the Chinese agreement, and um, and then to go through also with debt relief. And this was of course a political jackpot for for the Congolese uh, regime, so for the president and his um, and his entourage. Because before this, I don't think. I mean, it's been. During my field work around this, you know, it was quite clear that Kabila probably wasn't sure if he was ever going to get debt relief. And actually to get debt relief and the Sikomin agreement was a dream situation. And this was because, and this is what I argue, is that this was a case of China-powered agency because it's not sure that the donors would have been so quick to get pushed debt relief through if this Chinese agreement hadn't hadn't come, you know, to kind of potentially block the entire process. So this definitely was a case of China powered agency. However, if we look at what happened after that, because so I think the public perception in Congo and elsewhere among policymakers was that this is the situation, you know, that that um, the DRC was really helped by China and then the wow, China is not such a strong partner in terms of providing a DRC with agency, but China's approach to the DRC changed from 2010 onwards. And I argue in the paper that there were two reasons for this. First, that Chinese actors came to realize that DRC is really a risky place to do business. Um, there were issues in terms of the financing, there were issues around, um, you know, China Exim Bank at some point pulled out as a financier because they thought this was too big a risk. They wanted more security than they had had, um, et cetera. And um, so it was really, I think, or, or I know that Sikomin for the Chinese had, they had a different um, view of what it would be like to invest directly in the DRC. So they came to realize the, that the DRC is a risky place and we have indeed seen no other such loans come in. That kind of financing, I mean, Chinese investments in the mining sector after this has come in the form of mergers and acquisitions. So when you buy a share of it of a of a Western company, um, you you buy um, a share of, an, of of a company that has a sizable investment. So you still you know, cater to your strategic needs, but not through the complicated direct investments. And this is a really important reasons 
part of the Chinese change. So the actual other change that I think is important is to, that it, if China wants to be a responsible international actor, which it wants to be, it doesn't combine well with providing, you know, African countries with agency to challenge the IMF and other Western donors. It just doesn't work. So as I see it, that Sikomin and the whole uh, politics around it exposed a dissonance in Chinese foreign policy making that really needed to be reconciled. And, uh, and the, yeah, the reconciliation is that China doesn't do this kind of, doesn't enable agency in that sense anymore. Currently, um, I mean, the paper runs until 2019, but the analysis, I think, um, of the pattern is still valid, is that China is still a very stable partner for the DSE. It still has strong strategic interests in the country. It is increasingly taking up a role as a force for stability um, in terms of its role in the UN, what it has been saying in the Security Council, was appointing also um, one of its ambassadors um, to the as a regional representative for the Great Dex region of the for the UN, um, who has seen. So China has an important role, but it's just uh, it's different. It's it's uh, it doesn't provide the DRC with agency to challenge other donors or the IMF. Um, and the prime example of this, I see, I think, is the elections in in twenty eighteen. Because, of course, Kabila tried to extend his mandate um, and, and tried to do all sorts of things to stay in power. And this is the kind of situation where Kabila could really have used support from China, provided, you know, if he, that's the kind of situation where you would need China-powered agency to stay in power. But China didn't provide Kabila with that. China kept a very low profile during the whole election period, favored a local solution to the conflict around the elections. Um, and I mean, I, when I've discussed my argument with, with other observers around Congo, they would say, you know, taking a low profile in the kind of situation is a kind of way to favor Kabila. But what I mean is that it's not, um, it, it isn't an open, China did not take sides or provide Kabila with that kind of agency. It's a, diff, you know, to take, they had a low profile, but did not throw their weight behind anyone. So which kind of shows that there is no such China powered agency um, provided at the moment. So the conclusion, just to wrap it up, is that I think the DRC case reflects quite nicely China's learning journey in international politics since opening up in, in 2000. This goes back to Pilani's interesting comment, you know, about in, uh, Africa's role in international relations. I think this is an excellent case to show <clears throat> what China has learned and is doing um, in international politics. Uh, it also shows that there's a strong continuity in terms of Congolese agency in, in international politics, meaning that the Congolese regime um, and its ability to exercise agency in relation to other external actors is strong, that agency is strong when external actors' strategic interests enable um, such agency. And this means, of course, in conclusion, that it's a circumscribed kind of agency. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Joanna. Um, that's yeah. This is so interesting. Thank you. Um, we're going to move ahead um, directly to, to our next paper, which is which is focusing on a second extremely controversial um, China-Africa relationship, um, the one um, with Djibouti. Um, I think for many South Africans, Djibouti is probably the most famous for um, for the fact that it hosts so many different um, military bases, including both a Chinese, the only Chinese overseas base, um, and and a, a massive American base um, within within kilometers from each other. Um, so we're delighted to, to have uh, Jean-Pierre Capistan, who's a, who's a professor um, in political science at Hong Kong Baptist University and a Djibouti expert to join us today. Um, go ahead, Jean-Pierre, thanks so much. Thanks, thanks, Copas, for your very kind invitation. I'm delighted to be with you, uh, although it's uh, a bit late in Hong Kong, but that's fine. I, I have my dinner and, and I'm ready and, and happy to talk about uh, Djibouti a place um, uh, which I visited for the first time in 2011. Uh, at the time, the Chinese were already around, but um, uh, they were very discreet. Uh, what, what the major footprint of the Chinese at the time were the, the port calls 
which uh, their naval ships were making in Djibouti because uh, since 2008, you may know that uh, the PLA Navy, the People's Liberation Army Navy, uh, was, uh, has been taking uh, part in, in anti-piracy operation in the Gulf of Aden. And, and that's the first major contact between uh, China and Djibouti. Now, 2011 is another interesting year uh, and prior to the BRI, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative launched by Xi Jinping and the Chinese government in 2013, is the fact that actually uh, China had already an interest in Djibouti, which was not directly uh, focused on Djibouti, it was much more, much more focused on Ethiopia, which I visited the same year in 2011 for the first time. And uh, that's uh, the year 2011 when the uh, decision to build a new railway uh, from Djibouti to Addis Ababa along the line, uh, you know, of the old railway built by the French more a century before um, was made. And uh, clearly uh, the, 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 the intention was for China to um, increase its influence in the Horn of Africa, but uh, taking uh, Ethiopia as a center because Ethiopia is the powerhouse of the Horn of Africa and Djibouti could uh, play a role in, that, in, in, in better connecting uh, Ethiopia to the outside world. So now if we look at the, you know, the question of uh, Djibouti's agency, and I will refer to the same, uh, um, the same uh, definition as Johanna, which is an ability to make independent decisions, it looks like uh, it's nearly hopeless uh, for, for a country like Djibouti to make independent decisions fast in face of a behemoth like China. If you look at the asymmetry between the two countries, it's so uh, striking that uh, there is maybe even uh, not the, you know, a, a good reason for looking at the issue. Uh, Djibouti is a smaller than Belgium with one, one million inhabitants, uh, uh, and I don't need to mention the, the size and the population of China. Uh, it's a GDP, uh, it's uh, around 3.5 billion US uh, dollars. Uh, China is uh, for 15 trillion dollars. So um, a, a huge, a huge asymmetry. Yet what is interesting and, uh, is that Djibouti has played his card pretty well, I would say. Um, uh, in, uh, well, thanks first of all, uh, to some of the assets which were given by geography to Djibouti. The fact that Djibouti is located in a very strategic lo location at the, at the mouth of the Bab el Mandeb, which is a strategic strait. Um, uh, which uh, a lot of ships uh, need to take in order to reach the Suez Canal, which you have heard of recently. Um, uh, and and uh, the, these, these location has been, uh, you know, uh, as, as sort of uh, justify the, uh, for, for the French to keep some military presence there, 1,500 soldiers. And, and for the US uh, after the, uh, beginning of the war against terrorism to set up a base uh, which is pretty important because it has uh, 4,000 soldiers. Uh, and this base is aimed at uh, fighting against uh, terrorism in a number of, uh, in the Middle East, uh, in a number of places like Yemen and Somalia. Now, so they, 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 there's been a, for some time a great power of interest in Djibouti and China's participation in the anti-piracy operation has uh, enhanced, of course, the interest in the region, uh, apart from the interest I've mentioned in Ethiopia. Now, the BRI has, has of course, uh, sort of um, deepened China's involvement in Djibouti, uh, but many of the projects uh, which uh, were agreed upon, infrastructure projects uh, uh, between China and, and Djibouti were agreed upon before 2013, actually, the railways, uh, the uh, um, uh, the uh, some some water conservancy uh, project and, and so on. It's only the major uh, the, the Raleigh port uh, decision was made later. The uh, now I have to say a few words about the the Djibouti polity and the political system itself. As you may know, if you are in Africa, um, President Ismail Gale has been reelected a fifth time on the 9th of April for another five year term um, uh, as president of Djibouti. He's the nephew of the first president uh, who was elected after independence from France in, 20, in 1977. So he's been in power for more than 20 years now. 
and uh, he and his clan uh, um, well, well belong to the uh, Isa group, uh, the major group uh, uh, in, in the ethnic group in Djibouti, have dominated the political spectrum and political life in Djibouti. So Djibouti is not really a democracy. You had an election a few days ago, and uh, Gele uh, managed to get 98% of the of the of the uh, of the votes, uh, indicating that there was no really uh, um, no real opposition to his uh, to his re-election. So that's one thing which has, in a way, I have to say, uh, strengthened his hands because many of the decisions have been made by him or his clan or very people very close to him, and uh, and that has strengthened the. Uh, Djibouti's uh, hand in, in his uh, dealing with, with, with not only with China but other Djibouti's uh, stakeholders, uh, France but also uh, the US. Now one thing I would like to mention is the fact that uh, you know to sort of um, illustrate uh, Djibouti's uh, agency uh, is that when the Chinese um, started to uh, mention, uh, you know, to, to, to toy with the idea of establishing a naval base in Djibouti in 2013. Uh, the Americans, neither the American nor the French, were in a position to sort of uh, twist Gele's arm and uh, telling him, uh, well, not to, not to uh, grant uh, China's uh, request. Um, they've not, you know, even the United States was not in a position to, you know, he could have le left uh, Djibouti, but it was not in a position strong enough to sort of uh, force uh, uh, Gele's hand. And um, as a result, uh, today you have seven uh, distinct uh, contingents in Djibouti, military contingents in Djibouti, uh, including China, which is the latest uh, new, I mean, latest. Uh, 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 um, uh, Contingent to set up a base in Djibouti, which may include 2,000 officers and soldiers, although we don't know exact number of soldiers there. Now, what of course has alarmed the West, uh, the, the West, and particularly the, the American, but also the French, has been this connection, this uh, this sort of uh, uh, close um, interaction between uh, China's interest in uh, developing. Uh, 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 economic presence in Djibouti and its strategic interest or, or in, in setting up a, a base there. Because if you look at the, well, the decision to set up a base was made in 2013, the BRR was launched in 2013, and all the major, the, 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 the major investment regarding the port of Djibouti and the Dorale multi-purpose port were made later in 2015 or 2018. So, so clearly the, the, the connection between the two uh, decisions. Now, uh, if we look at the, at the port uh, project itself, I think it's uh, uh, interesting to indicate here that, um, as you, some of you may know, is that uh, the, the Raleigh container port, the terminal, was first developed by, with the assistance of Dubai Port uh, World. And uh, the decision, the Dele Gele made a decision in 2018 to, to sort of stop, uh, uh, suspend this contract, uh, Djibouti's contract with DPUW, and to actually uh, uh, strengthen Djibouti's control on, its, on the port authority. So, uh, and that's how, uh, um, uh, that's how the Dubai port uh, world was, was ex expelled from Djibouti, as you know, there's an arbitration ongoing. I mean, uh, uh, with a decision detrimental to, to Djibouti, which was made a year ago, but Djibouti has not uh, carried out the decision, has not paid any compensation to Dubai on that, on that issue. But uh, since then, of course, the Chinese have come, uh, have stepped in, and China merchants have uh, taken control of, uh, um, uh, has, well, taken some shares in the Port Authority of Djibouti, and in particular managed uh, this, uh, the uh, deep, the, the um, the uh, the Raleigh multi-purpose port, which is another uh, terminal in, in Djibouti. So what is interesting actually is this contrary to some reports have indicated, uh, it's not the Chinese or China merchant which sort of, sort of have uh, uh, put pressure on Gele to, to, to get rid of Dubai, uh, but it was a deliberate decision of, of Gele to, uh, and, the, and the Djibouti government to uh, uh, nationalize the uh, the uh, port authority uh, and, and to in order to strengthen um, actually Djibouti's autonomy in his uh, uh, in his relationship with his major partners in the region. 
Um, now, uh, since then, uh, 2018, there's been, um, I think, um, a sort of decrease of China's uh, um, loans and, and infrastructure projects. Uh, for one reason, of course, is the uh, first reason is that uh, uh, the F uh, IMF uh, uh, rang the alarm bell in 2018 and said, well, you have to be careful, you over indebted and, in, in, uh, the, and, and including to, uh, to China. So since then, there's been a number of Chinese projects which have been put on hold, suspended or canceled, and uh, Djibouti's uh, debt uh, remains pretty high. It's, uh, it's, it's um, around 70% uh, 70 of the GDP it has gone down a bit since 2018. And, and China's um, sharing the, the uh, uh, Djibouti Excel debt is around 70%, so 1.4 billion US dollar, which is uh, not uh, a small amount of money for, for, for Djibouti. But what we can see is that since then, uh, the Djibouti government has decided to diversify its partnership, has continued to work with other countries. Uh, I give the example of the uh, desalinization um, uh, plant, which has just been uh, inaugurated just outside of the rally. Uh, naval base actually uh, built by the French FL group. Um, and uh, you see also the Saudi Arabia being very much involved in Djibouti with providing funds for a number of uh, uh, infrastructure projects. Even if Saudi Arabia eventually decided not to set up a um, uh, 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 military base in Djibouti, there were a lot of speculations around 2018 that maybe Saudi Arabia would join the club of uh, you know, the various uh, contingents, uh, military contingents um, present in Djibouti, but it didn't. Uh, that didn't uh, has not materialized uh, since then. So, so you see, uh, actually, Djibouti uh, uh, managing to sort of uh, mitigate up to a point. I think China's uh, 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 domination in in, in its uh, uh, infrastructure projects. And I think the uh, a bit like in the DRC, I would say the uh, China has not been able to sort of prevent the IMF so from getting in and 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 and, and sort of. Uh, uh, constraining Djibouti in its, uh, you know, uh, 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 own uh, uh, um, projects and 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 and, re and economic relation with the, with the China. So um, now the other thing is, which is I would like to mention at the end is that more than we think, there's been the reason China has, um, uh, you know, in increase its economic influence in Djibouti is uh, uh, mainly twofold. One is that China's uh, project and the BRI uh, and, and China's ambitions, uh, economic ambitions as a whole, have pretty well converged with Djibouti's own economic and, and development plans. If you look at the Djibouti 2035 with its vision for the future to turn Djibouti into a new Singapore, the Horn of Afri Africa, uh, whether it's going to materialize is another story, but uh, the, well, what has clearly started to materialize, not to turn Djibouti into a new Singapore, but maybe a new Dubai or small Dubai, in, in a sense that Djibouti is becoming a real transmission, transship, transshipment logistic hub uh, of the Horn of Africa. And that today uh, there are not many uh, competitors. The major competitor in the future may be Barbera in Somaliland, which uh, Ethiopia is trying to develop, uh, or some of the ports uh, of, of, uh, of um, uh, Eritrea, a country with which Ethiopia has reconciled uh, um, uh, not long ago. But, but the, civil, you know, the, the, the tensions and even the civil war in northern Ethiopia, in Tigray, uh, are not conducive to you know, sort of, uh, increases, increasing the chances for those ports uh, uh, Masala and uh, Asab of, of being operational uh, in the forty. Bera may be more likely, but it will take time uh, as well. Uh, so, so that's the first, uh, uh, I think, uh, driver. The second one is that actually, and that's a bit like in the DRC and quite a number of African countries, is that at the time, um, Gale and the uh, Djibouti government wanted to you know, uh, 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 finalized their Djibouti 2035 project, in, that's what in 2014, they didn't have any options actually. They didn't have any countries uh, ready to invest in Djibouti uh, at the time. And the same kind of pattern, uh, which uh, 
uh, has been pretty obvious in the case of the railway from Djibouti to Zebeva in 20, 2011, when at the same, uh, exactly uh, in the same kind of um, fashion, the uh, Ethiopia and Djibouti didn't have any other options but to, to, to ask the Chinese to build, it, to build the railway. Uh, after 2014, the same uh, applied to the uh, transshipment uh, project, logistical hub projects of, of, uh, of Djibouti, and including the project to develop a, a free trade zone uh, and to turn it, if possible, into uh, industrial park. That's that step maybe maybe may, may is, is more problematic, as I mentioned at the end of my paper. Um, there is no tradition of industrial production in Djibouti, and uh, if uh, you know, I think a transshipment logistic hub is is already in place and can continue to expand, partly with the help of the Chinese, uh, to turn Djibouti into the new Singapore with the industrial base uh, remains to be remains to be seen. Now, the latest report, uh, which uh, have been pub made public um, after my paper was. Uh, actually published in October 2020, uh, 20, last year, 2020. Um, it's been the um, uh, a report in, uh, which came in January 2021, indicating that actually China would be ready to expand the Raleigh port uh, in injecting another uh, 500,000, 500 million US dollars and eventually 300, 3 billion US dollars. Uh, we have to be careful with those uh, announcements because uh, it will, uh, again, Djibouti is in a difficult uh, financial situation and we'll have to uh, watch very carefully uh, with the IMF and other institutions, international institutions, whether they can really move forward and uh, continue to expand their uh, logistical hub in the Horn of Africa. So on that note, I will conclude my uh, presentation and uh, give back, uh, back to you, Kobus. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jean-Pierre. Um, so just just a very brief few comments, um, just reflecting on, on Jean-Pierre and Johanna's papers. Um, it, it strikes me that that one, one way of, of thinking about African agency um, is that it's not really possible to think about the impact of, of what China, the impact that China has had on African agency without seeing the, the kind of the kind of landscape of structural exclusion that I think, like, you know, dominates Africa's general position in the world. Um, you know, so so I think that the, the the fact that China in some cases opened additional, you know, additional options to these countries, you know, kind of is, you know, kind of is, fits within a larger context of very few options for them. You know, so so I think you know that that's an important thing to keep in mind, and I think it's it's an that's an important kind of. You know, issue to keep in mind in generally, in general, when looking at China-Africa relations. Um, in in the second place, um, you know, it, it also I think shows that that the, you know there, there's a kind of a drumbeat coming out of out of um, the you know the the kind of Republican part of, of the U.S. particularly, um, although I think it's, it's 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 becoming more kind of there's more bipartisan support now from the U.S. of uh, for a kind of an articulation of the the China-Africa relationship in in or framing of it in terms of a kind of a new Cold War, um, you know, as, as a kind of a with with this with this additional kind of idea of this, this kind of pressure on, on, on global South governments to choose one or the other. I think these papers really show how a reductionist view of the world that is. Um, because even in these cases where, you know, kind of where one could one could characterize it as, as you know, these African governments playing off China against other, other actors, the, the range of actors involved is so is so broad, um, including you know kind of like supranational bodies like the IMF, but also a lot of a lot of Chinese commercial interests and Chinese companies being you know kind of being increasingly involved, and that we're seeing in the Congo particularly because of its its you know the, the because of its large uh, volumes of, of cobalt reserves um, where there's a you know there's as many Chinese companies being extremely involved in, in, in that sector um, and and you know then the growth of logistics and, and kind of military involvement in, in Djibouti in the sense that 
the, you know, you, you both see that, that you need to take all of these different actors in, in, into account rather than be, kind of beyond state actors themselves, but also that you still see that in a lot of ways, the kind of agency that these countries can draw from, from these kind of strategic aspects of, of their existence is still, you know, externally defined or externally, you know, kind of uh, um, framed. You know, so, so for example, the DRC, a massive country, massively culturally important in Africa, like very influential country, um, you know, it's generally kind of described as in, quote unquote important, externally important because of the kind of mineral reserves rather than because of say, you know, it's the fact that it, that it touches so many other African borders, for example. So, you know, so, so there is this kind of like external imposition of these, of these ideas kind of beyond the, the kind of framing that these governments want to put on it themselves. Um, and I think in this case, like Jean-Pierre's work on Djibouti is very interesting um, because it, it does show this kind of attempt from an African government to try and kind of reframe some of these, you know, so some of these forms of engagement, um, you know, with, with more and less success, depending on, you know, kind of on, on what the, the particular circumstances are at the moment. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop there. Um, for those who want to ask questions of, of Jean-Pierre and, and, and um, Joanna, please put those questions into the, into the chat. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll move forward with the other two papers um, and then we'll have uh, everyone together, you know, kind of to, to, to hash out some some of some of these issues. The second set of papers um, we we group together because it, to our mind they seem to focus on what we chose to call social agency. So in this case the the decision making power of, of African populations about uh, the, the decision about, about the direction in which they, they, their societies are going to develop um, not only in relation to the power of China, but also in relation to their own government's power, frequently strengthened by their relationships with China. So, um, you know, so so the one of the one of the the discussions in, in the, the agency debate tended to well, one of the weaknesses, to my mind, in, in the discussion. Um, in, is in the excuse me is in the um, the the way that it tends to frame um, a African agency as governmental agency with with the kind of assumption that if 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 African governments are more empowered in relation to China then that that empowerment will then also be visited or you know kind of be be shared with their own citizens. I think people who who spend a lot of time focusing on on African life knows that that frequently doesn't happen. There's frequently a very big power gap and a very big trust gap between, between African governments and African populations and China, like engagement with China, you know, kind of a lot of the controversy around engagement with China is because of the way that it plays into that, ga that gap of trust between African governments and African people. Um, so the first paper um, is by Eugenio Galliardone, um, who's an associate professor in media studies at, at, at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. He's also, he's the author of China, Africa and the Future of the Internet. So uh, and in, in this, you know, he's, he's going he's gonna to look at wide, broad ranging issues of, of the impact of, of Chinese ICT provision in Africa and the, its impact on African civil liberties. Um, take it away, Eugenio. Thanks so much. Well, thank you very much, Cobus. And uh, well, I want to start by thanking uh, um, Sai and Cobus in particular. I still remember when Cobus convinced me um, to write this paper, we were sitting in front of the matrix at BETS and it was still possible to, to meet in person. And uh, I hope we will get uh, back there very soon. So uh, this is the paper. I can't see myself. I hope you can see me. Um, and uh, um, I would like to wrap it uh, um, around uh, three, three particular points uh, um, that help to understand the impact or in some cases, the lack of impact uh, of Chinese tech provision on civil liberties in Africa. So, and each point somehow, as we move from the first one to the third one, uh, sort of marks both an historical progression from the very beginning of, uh, of this relationship uh, to more present days. Uh, but also as we move, it moves from a kind of a bird's eye of uh, a continental overview to a more particular focus. So the first point can probably be framed uh, as a question, and, uh, and it's a question that was uh, asked very much at the beginning of this relationship, at the beginnings uh, of uh, China stepping up its effort in, uh, in, um, 
in ICTs, uh, is, is China a net exporter of authoritarianism? And this, this question was being asked in different fashions. One was, uh, are countries that are receiving support from China in the tech sector going to become more authoritarian? Or are Chinese authorities going to pick up likes uh, and support authoritarian regimes uh, more than democratic regimes? And uh, the assumption of this question sort of stemmed from the experience of uh, previous, uh, previous donor countries. And uh, in, in the past, especially in the West, uh, has countries like the US or the UK, uh, has they provided assistance in this space? At the same time, they tended to suggest policies and politics uh, that characterize, characterize their own models. And probably the most uh, a famous or tragic example in this case uh, was in post-war Iraq, where in the tussle between uh, uh, the UK and the US uh, in trying to decide between uh, a, a, um, a BBC model uh, to, to, to reframe and, uh, uh, and reorganize uh, uh, state media or a more liberalized model. But if we look at empirical evidence, if we look at the uh, statements that are available out there, um, Chinese authorities has actually been very silent in this space. And, uh, and this is obviously not enough. And, uh, but also if we go down to the level of individual countries and I resonate with, uh, with the comments made before, you know, the importance of uh, not basing our studies on presupposition, but of empirical evidence, uh, we will see that uh, uh, the, the picture is much more diverse and lends very little to the idea of uh, a one model that is uh, imposed for some or even suggested to other countries. So uh, Cobus was very kind uh, to mention uh, the book uh, that I wrote and came out a couple of years ago, China, Africa, and the Future of the Internet. And what I did was uh, uh, analyzing two different uh, set of countries. Uh, one set uh, considered as more authoritarian, Ethiopia, that was already mentioned, and Rwanda, and the other one more democratic. And uh, the data emerging from these, uh, these relationship can't be uh, more diverse. Uh, in the case of Ethiopia, Ethiopia received, uh, as it is in the report, uh, the largest loan in the history of telecommunication in Africa, more than $3 billion uh, used to completely overall uh, uh, the telecommunication system in the country. And uh, China has... Uh, helped the once uh, uh, EPRDF dominated government uh, to achieve uh, a very stubborn project uh, of uh, um, expanding access in the, uh, in the regime of monopoly. But then if we shift to uh, Ghana and Kenya, we will see that China actually has come very late in the competition and simply fit in a very variegated and very open uh, uh, and liberalized market uh, and just was one of the main players helping to support some specific project, uh, but in no ways uh, at the size and the level that could uh, reshape uh, information societies in this country. So, and uh, if we looked at the last example, Rwanda, which apart from the size, uh, probably is the country that shared the most uh, from a political and, uh, and, uh, um, and developmental point of view with China in terms of legitimacy, in terms of like uh, uh, the, the, the wrapping uh, uh, the national narrative uh, about an idea of uh, national development, uh, um, uh, Rwanda is indeed overall the uh, telecommunication sector through external support. But in this case, it was not China, but it was South Korea that uh, uh, stepped up uh, and uh, Belay plays the, more or less the same role that China plays in Ethiopia. So uh, what I'm trying to say is it doesn't try to absolve China from its responsibilities, but the point is uh, these responsibilities have to be found in practice uh, rather than being presupposed. And uh, often China, uh, as I found in my research, which is mentioned here and in other, um, and in other, in other papers, uh, it's just one of the many actors. So one example that I use all the time, and some of you, I apologize if you uh, heard it before, also comes from Ethiopia. And uh, because of the Snowden revelation, uh, now we know that uh, um, the, um, uh, the NSA uh, has been supporting uh, a very ambitious project uh, called uh, uh, Lion's Pride, uh, aimed at uh, training for the first time Ethiopian spies uh, in uh, uh, online surveillance uh, in the Horn of Africa. And because of uh, excellent work that is being done by colleagues at the Citizen Lab in Toronto, in Canada, 
We also know that uh, the Ethiopian government uh, has been purchasing software from European companies uh, based in the UK and based in Italy to um, surveil uh, um, opposition politicians. And as, just, and, and as I just said, uh, uh, China has completely redesigned and redeployed uh, um, the uh, telecommunication infrastructure in Ethiopia. So here's the paradox uh, and uh, kind of a hypothetical scenario. If you are an Ethiopian spy, you are likely to have been trained by the Americans to use software produced in Europe uh, to harvest data on a China's built network. And, uh, and this kind of picture, you know, China tends to lend itself to a kind of narrow focus uh, that uh, uh, aggrandizes China's role and sort of misses uh, the other components. And uh, in, in, uh, in the, the, the next presentation uh, by, by Michael uh, and his, in his paper, uh, that comes out uh, uh, very clearly as well, talking about IBM uh, and others. So um, in a way, it's like, is that it? So it's just very complex, very diverse, and, uh, and uh, we have to just look at case studies. Actually not, and this is my second point, and sort of connects to Joanna's point about the, the, the need to historicize China, the, the role that China is having in different countries, and not just uh, look at a snapshot in time to sort of characterize the whole relationship with a specific country or a specific set of actors. So, so in these, I'm also going more specifically into the paper and, uh, and something that uh, I learned to, to recognize and study because of, uh, because of this particular piece of work. And what I'm referring to is the ambiguous and changing roles uh, of uh, Chinese corporate actors of Huawei and ZTE in particular. So if the Chinese, and going back to a point I made before, has been silent in, uh, uh, in the proposition of a particular model as something that uh, African governments, uh, in this case, uh, uh, should follow. Uh, corporate agents seem to have done so for a while, but in the past four or five years, things have changed dramatically. So uh, what I did in the study it was uh, conducting a survey and building on other research as well on some of the safe city and smart city projects deployed in Africa, but there are many others deployed in Europe or in Latin America. And in, in this case, it seems that a more aggressive stance uh, has uh, emerged over time. And, and the pitch is sort of like a very simple one. And uh, is uh, the like of Huawei and ZTE are pointing at the sophistication of uh, urban surveillance uh, in China and uh, building on facial recognition, uh, AI power solution, uh, uh, predictive policing and crowd control. Uh, and uh, when they reach out to their potential clients, governments or city administration, uh, they sort of like uh, uh, subtly, but quite firmly say, well, if you want to achieve these kind of uh, uh, results, uh, you shouldn't look elsewhere. And, uh, and in this case, the Chinese model, or at least the Chinese outcomes or the results of a specific way to deploy technologies uh, are used as a pitch uh, to, um, to present uh, um, an argument about why certain governments, again, this point is not limited to, to China, to, uh, to Africa, uh, should uh, um, should adopt these technologies and not others. Uh, but also this kind of change relationship has a number of paradoxes, and I will just highlight a few. Uh, so Chinese uh, surveillance, Chinese companies have been accused uh, of exporting surveillance uh, in ways that are impinging on civil liberties. Uh, but the kind of evidence that we have found that is in the report as well, uh, doesn't make as many difference from any pitch that a commercial company would do. And, uh, and it seems that once again, uh, the fact that it is China, the, the actor behind these kind of uh, um, initiatives, uh, it's what uh, um, represents the, the, uh, the most troubling concern. And sort of, and going back to Kobo's introduction, uh, uh, prevents from looking at this issue from the bottom up, from the perspective of the citizen, which might be less troubled by the fact that it's a Chinese or an American or Japanese company surveilling them. Uh, the problem is uh, these technology is being deployed uh, without any public debate. And the second point uh, which I think should be impacted, I didn't try to, uh, to, to propose any particular interpretation, but I think it's, uh, it's an interesting one, uh, is this kind of contradiction between the silence coming from uh, uh, state actors uh, and the assertiveness uh, emerging from uh, uh, corporate agents. And this is interesting because uh, some of the claims uh, uh, made by the former president Donald Trump, for example, uh, point at the collusion between uh, 
corporate uh, and uh, and and state, uh, and this is behind the, the the Huawei ban and the TikTok ban and so forth. But is it really the case? Uh, are uh, Huawei and ZTE responding more to uh, the interest of profit, the interest of expanding their market uh, than others? This is what we will expect from Facebook or from Eric uh, Al uh, Erickson Alcatel. Uh, why is China behaving differently? Or a more suspicious way to 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 look at this relationship is a kind of like a good cop and bad cop and is the state doing the, the, the good cop and sort of saying it's just good for benefit uh, and the uh, and the corporate agents uh, are sort of like uh, trying to promote a model and uh, and this leads me uh, to a third point uh, which is like so is this development uh, puts people in greater danger as compared to previous one where the focus was simply on infrastructure and simply to responding to the demand of African governments. And this is for me probably the most interesting one. And uh, because uh, it sort of points at an obvious uh, um, argument, uh, an obvious way of looking at technology that is unfortunately forgotten all the time. And uh, I would call this third point the, the technopolitics of surveillance. So if we look at many headlines and also some reports on Chinese surveillance tech uh, uh, in Africa, they seem to be characterized by the kind of sense of moral panic. And, uh, oh my God, the Chinese, we are all doomed. The AI power systems are coming and uh, we will lose our freedom. But this is the paradox, or maybe it's just a serious flow. So statement like these uh, uh, seems to presuppose that this technology, because of their probably more sinister and more cunning nature, um, or sometimes I call technologies of freedom, for example, they will succeed where liberation technologies that for decades we expected to free the world from abuse and, and, uh, and dictators, they are failed. And uh, but these technologies, both types of technologies, uh, uh, have to relate in similar ways to the very complex technopolitical realities of the country where they are immersed. And, uh, the technopolitics of Ethiopia or Kenya or Rwanda are significantly different uh, from uh, those that uh, have characterized China and the evolution of the information society over the past two decades. And uh, there is some research, and I think we would need more research, uh, emerging from uh, actual deployment of uh, safe city and smart city in Mombasa, in Nairobi, but also in Lahore and, uh, and uh, in other countries sort of along the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, showing that uh, these many of these projects has actually failed and faltered in the same ways that others coming from uh, a different conceptual angle liberate empower connect uh, have failed in similar ways and uh, if we look at uh, crime rates they have dwindled over the years going up some years and going down other years uh, showing almost no correlation between the deployment of this particular technology and uh, the effect on the ground and, uh, and another example that I came to look at, it's not in the report, uh, is Cloudwalk. Cloudwalk made the headlines in 2018. Cloudwalk is uh, an AI um, facial recognition company that signed a contract with Zimbabwe in 2018. And the headline were once again, we are doomed, and uh, uh, the, the whole Zimbabwean population under an authoritarian regime uh, is going to lend its faces to uh, a Chinese technology in order to refine its facial recognition. And uh, the latest report showed that uh, most of the cameras are just lying and used, uh, and uh, the Zimbabwean government is flagging the project as an un, um, um, unaccounted level of, uh, uh, of, uh, of deployment. So um, what should, you know, the point that, that I want to make at the end uh, is, uh, and it sort of like resonated with other things in the panel, and I look forward to Michael's point, uh, is the relevance of sort of shifting away from this kind of moral panic assumptions and sort of look, which in COVID time is particularly complicated, uh, at uh, the specific ways and here the narrowing to the, to the detail uh, in which specific pieces of technology may or may not interact with social norms, uh, different ways of understanding privacy, different ways to going around and mocking technology in a way that uh, uh, will become ineffective uh, and uh, in, uh, in, in, in a new context that can not be predicted from, uh, from agents coming from another space. And uh, I look forward to hearing what Michael says to say in, the, in, in this regard. Thank you. 
Thanks, Eugenio. Um, we, we're moving on to our, our next our next paper um, hones in um, on a particular case study of one of these one of these safe city projects um, in Johannesburg. Um, and as people who know Johannesburg know that it's a city that's extremely obsessed with issues of crime. Um, that that you know it's it's a, it's a city where where crime, discussions about crime take up take up a, a, a very big part of our of daily life, um, as also chronicled in a book that I just put out, which is about anxiety in Johannesburg, um, where, you know, kind of once you, once you start talking about what makes Johannesburg people anxious, crime really comes up. Um, so, um, yeah, we, we, we're delighted to have Michael here. He, he holds a PhD um, in sociology for Rhodes University, and he's currently um, a visiting fellow at the Yale Information Society Project at Yale University. Take it away, Michael. All right, thank you for having me on here. And uh, um, I read uh, Ingenio's, most of Ingenio's book yesterday and I highly recommend it. And uh, one of the things I really liked about it uh, was he, he, he did a, uh, he paid, placed great emphasis on, um, you know, being empirical and um, looking at four case studies. It was uh, Kenya, Ghana, Rwanda, and um, Ethiopia and um, looking at the ICT sector in Africa. So that was uh, a great read and, and I highly recommend it. Um, so, all right, um, you know, following from uh, Eugenio, um, the, I, I do agree that there's a, a great deal of, uh, of a racket almost in the Safe Cities projects. Um, I started looking into the um, safe cities and, and camera projects, I want to say at the end of uh, 2016, sometime in 2016, when I was, you know, uh, at Rhodes University, they, they put up a lot of cameras on campus. Um, and then also I have been watching a uh, documentary on internet in Africa. And it's it's, act, it's linked in one of the articles that I write about um, a company that would eventually be called Vumicam, which is a mass uh, uh, CCTV uh, surveillance, uh, safety and security surveillance uh, project that was rolled out in the Johannesburg suburbs and is expanding throughout the country. And um, in that documentary, they said that there was a, in the, a little suburb of Parkhurst in, in Joburg, um, the there they were talking about getting fiber and they were rolling out fiber actually for the cameras and getting high speed internet was something of a of a kind of secondary benefit although it was highly coveted um, as well um, but um, so I mean I thought that was interesting because that was the first fiber to the home project and as as a kind of symbolism for South Africa. Um, um, you know, getting fiber to the home and, and fiber to the home in general, not to estates, um, to like a whole suburb. Uh, its purpose was to, uh, you know, uh, surveil the streets. And obviously in South Africa, there is uh, uh, very real and uh, unsettling amount of, of crime when walking around in the streets in, in certain areas, um, in many areas. Uh, but nevertheless, the question becomes, well, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to turn your society into a surveillance state? And then, of course, um, is it actually really effective? So I wound up talking to people from the residents associations. I spoke with city officials uh, in Joburg, also in Cape Town, and, and um, some folks in Dur Durban. And um, I talked to a lot of vendors. And I also looked at, at things on the US side. And I, I tried to do a deep dive really on the industry in general. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that is uh, most certainly true is that a lot of these projects are over oversold, they're hyped. Um, they kind of cash in on a moral panic around crime. Um, and uh, although some of that really is um, real. I mean, there are, I, I mean, some of the people I spoke with in, in Joburg had experiences where people were robbed at gunpoint or, or uh, mugged and, and things like that. And it's not to downplay that. Um, but again, it's, it's to ask that question of, well, is this solution then just putting up 
cameras everywhere in society and, and where is that going to leave you? Now, if you look at um, the evolution of some of these projects, what's one interesting component is this um, model that you have, I call it for, because there's, there's no label for it. I, I call it a plug-in model where private sector can plug in cameras into a, a wider network. And um, Project Greenlight in Detroit is one that does it. Uh, New York City has uh, Microsoft Aware, uh, which is sometimes called the domain awareness system, but there are general domain awareness systems, um, not just that one. Uh, so the product name is called Microsoft Aware. And, and that allows, say, a private business to add a camera onto the police network. And there's different ways of, of structuring that, like in terms of accessibility that the police get on the other side, do they get access just to the live feed? Can they get access to recordings and so on? Uh, but in general, um, what it winds up happening is that you can build a, a pub where some of the costs of installing and maintaining and purchasing the cameras are offloaded onto the private sector and, and uh, it, you know, depending on the on the deployment, um, even private citizens uh, who can add cameras on as residents, and so um, that can massively expand the amount of eyes that are out there, are, are that are um, you know watching, and all of this grew up in the last like twenty or so years. So the old camera systems used to be um, uh, deployments that. Uh, you had one camera, it was analog, it was fuzzy, and maybe it recorded onto a cassette tape. And if something happened, then the cops have to come to the drive out there, re, you know, go back into the back room, look at the footage. And then if they want to pursue somebody, um, are there any other businesses, say, in the area that have a camera? And then that's very, uh, then they have to drive to the next spot if they're trying to follow somebody around. And that was very uh, time intensive. So it put severe limits on the ability to do surveillance in the society. Um, so what happened over time was they digitized the cameras and then they started bringing them in on video management system or video management software, um, BMSs. And those were built, um, say, Milestone Systems, um, based out of Denmark, was one of the major VMS uh, manufacturers, um, software developers. And uh, over time, you have the, the, this is where now you get these kind of command and control centers that can bring in uh, massive amounts of cameras. And you might see a big screen with a wall of cameras and that gives uh, some capacity to organize um, large, large scale deployments. And over time, you have uh, now these new networks that pop up that cover wide areas. And they also, um, um, or they organize the ability to access and make sense of this. And then you have in, in conjunction with this, the rise of video analytics and video analytics is used to basically categorize what the uh, image, what's going on on the screen. Um, it could be, and, and then index it so you can search through or so you can flag things in real time. It, so it might recognize if somebody's wearing a red shirt or if somebody's walking or if somebody's riding a bicycle. The more basic forms of analytics, like per, is this a person, is this a car? Um, those are the more accurate ones. And what the industry is trying to do is make accuracy behind more sophisticated things um, to get better over time. And so you had, you go from this kind of old school system to now this more sophisticated and, and advanced system. All of that said, uh, it is true that sometimes these deployments, as much as they're hyped by industry, um, don't necessarily uh, have a sophisticated deployment. So one of the South African vendors I talked to said he went to Nairobi, uh, this is from memory, but I believe it was Nairobi, um, and looking at their um, deployment and, you know, he went into their command and control room and, and he said, um, yeah, well, they don't know how to use the system. 
right? So there, that's not usually going to be reported in the press. And unfortunately, as, as people who look into these things and as the, the general public who's looking into this, we don't, we don't get enough uh, access. I do wanna commend um, the city of Johannesburg for uh, speaking with me. Uh, because they were very open and they were very uh, forthcoming with the details. But a lot of what goes into the report um, here really should have just been public information anyways. You know, I shouldn't have had to go and ask what cameras are being used and so on. Um, so in terms of um, the Safe Cities projects, uh, I think one of the, the things we can say about them is there, while there's a lot of hype, they can, they can do damage still. And they can be very destructive. And that was kind of like the pass law system in South Africa. I think there's a parallel there where um, the kinds of sophistication of the hope of the apartheid government for regulating quotas, racial quotas, and um, uh, for people to be in the white areas and, and to filter people out with great efficiency uh, wasn't really achieved if, if you look at it. Um, it was just extraordinarily primitive technological systems and uh, it was very difficult to maintain. But ne nevertheless, the pass law system was very destructive and um, it was used as a justification to um, arrest people, sometimes to torture them and um, uh, you know, somebody doesn't have a pass, uh, or they, the authorities say they don't have a pass and, you know, so it, it could wind up becoming something, um, that does damage. Cameras are used, for example, in the fees must fall protests to bring in students and to target leaders and kids were doing things like throwing rocks at buildings sometimes. I mean, obviously there were more intense things that were done, but uh, the point is, is, you know, on my campus at Rhodes, something as simple as, as, as somebody say throwing a rock at a building. Well, I mean, if they're, if they're looking at um, uh, targeting a movement on, on campus, then they can start using the footage and they did to start targeting some of the students. So the point is, is that these, um, as much as there is hype, there's also uh, the capacity and uh, for doing a lot of damage. And there's a growing capacity um, and sophistication of these systems. And if you look at something like Boomacam, they started off saying, they they announced in 2019 um, that they wanted to put 15,000 cameras to blanket Joburg. And they wound up uh, upgrading that. Ricky Crook, the CEO, wound up uh, telling the... Um, uh, T Tech Central podcast that uh, he wants to up it to a hundred thousand, and so the uh, if you look on a long term timeline of how fast these systems have grown and how much they've expanded in their sophistication, there is there is actually a good reason for a civil from a civil rights and liberties perspective to be very worried um, about the direction that that this can go in. And it's not healthy and it's not good to live in a filmed society. So going outside into an urban space, do you want that to be a filmed experience? Uh, I think the answer should be no, because as Eugenio said, there's no good evidence that any of this even touches the crime, you know, that it reduces crime, for example. And while you can always find some anecdotes and the police authorities will bring up anecdotes um, that having all these cameras in place led to the solving of this crime or that crime. It's going to happen on occasion when you put that many cameras in place. Uh, the trade-off is, is that there's no such thing as civil rights and liberties, um, when you're under constant surveillance. Um, and really it's putting aside the more general problems that people have in society, which are, are related to, uh, structural causes like poverty, and, and so on. So I just want to close out here talking a little bit um, about China and saying that um, one of the things that I think, you know, point should be made is, is that um, while China does deploy its own kind of dystopian kind and, and produce its own dystopian technologies and 
its own sophisticated camera networks and video analytics and facial recognition. And, and if you look at their own deployments in China, they're, they're rather in your face about it, right? That's one difference between them and the West. The West tries to make it look like they also simultaneously care or they're more subtle about their deployments and the way they sell. If you look at a, a Huawei promotional video on safe cities, it's just like, yo, we can see everything all the time. <laughs> and um, one of the things I didn't note here, um, and I won't go into detail, but um, that these systems are also merging data with, with other, other, so it's not just video surveillance, it's bringing in records data, um, you know, uh, uh, I wrote an article called the Microsoft police state, a couple of articles at the intercept that, that go into this stuff. But, um, the goal is ultimately to, to, to merge this with, with other data to, to make the city quote unquote smart so they can start using the video footage, but also other sensor data and records data and start having a more surveilled society where, um, they're managing city life and, and doing really, um, advanced um high tech driven policing as well um and china will be more in your face about it right they don't really when they advertise and market this stuff but a lot of this stuff is was invented in the west the west invented the video management software they invented the the facial recognition stuff they invented the video analytics um and they have deployments the the um the um I forget what it's called, the, the, the ring uh, uh, system, the label for it, but in the United Kingdom, right? They, I mean, they have a huge amount of cameras there. I mean, that's, you know, and, and the in the Chinese, um, so China tends to supply to the West very cheap cameras. So that's Hike Vision, that's Dawa. Um, they, they do have their own upper end uh, cameras, but one of the, so Vumacam uses hike vision, uh, the city of Joburg uses hike vision cameras. And they're, one of the reasons that they, they became so popular is around 2013, China flooded the market with these high or these uh, cheap um, cameras. Um, but it's one of the least interesting parts of it. Now they could um potentially down the line manufacture some of the more advanced parts uh they do have their own uh vms software and they do have their own video analytics and things like that but it still tends for at the enterprise level where you have large camera deployments um it still tends to be uh, milestone genetech um and western manufacturers that are supplying the more what I find more interesting parts. I, I find that the cameras until they run analytics on them are just kind of a basic, they're kind of a basic uh, um, component. And so, yeah, you're getting a camera, a hike, Vumicam gets a hike vision camera. Um, if it's a dumb camera, I mean, how much of a Chinese project is it really? I mean, they can get that camera from somewhere else. Um, so, I mean, we can, we can really go into detail and unpack, uh, that thing or, or, or the, the implications of that. Okay. Well, yeah, but you're getting from hike vision and now you're giving profits to hike vision and, and revenue. And then they're using that for repression, let's say in Xinjiang or, or something like that. Um, at the same time though, uh, if you're giving your profits to access and those are being deployed in the cities in the United States where, police are brutal towards black lives matter and you know the the general you know uh prejudices and, and problems we have in policing in the united states you're doing that too um so i just want to close saying that um really um um china's role in this is is interesting i think that if we're looking at ict in general uh i don't have time to go into it but i think that um uh, china is a, a distant second in terms of its role uh, by comparison to the United States. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have um, market share in 5G, fiber, safe cities projects, um, minerals in the Congo, uh, things like that, cheap cheap smartphones and um, you know maybe some also d decent ones. But um, if you start looking at the uh, general market, um, operating systems, office software, processors, social networks, streaming entertainment. I mean, the United States is in general, the king of um, global ICT. 
Um, so I do want to I do want to make sure I mention that. So because we're talking about safe cities, but we're also talking about China and Africa and ICT in general. Um, but I yeah, it's a very much um, uh, and you know it's a it's a mixed picture. You have to be empirical about it. And um, I'll just I'll leave it there. Um, thanks so much, Michael. Um, it's so it's so interesting. The um, <clears throat> the um, so we we quickly gonna um, hand it over to to my new um, colleague at Sai Isabel Bosman for for a quick few um, responses um, to Michael and the genius paper, and then we'll move from there to to general questions. So please feel free to to add any questions that you have in the chat. Thanks, Isabel. <laughs> Thank you, Quibus. Um, Just to start off, I just want to say uh, well done to both authors um, on these papers. Uh, they really got me thinking and uh, also relying with my own personal research interests. So I quite enjoyed reading them. Um, in terms of starting my response, then I'd like to focus on those things that did make me think. Um, so I did first read uh, Eugenio's paper and from the get go, um, this disparity between safe city and smart city. And I started wondering, what's the difference? Um, and, and what do these terms uh, sort of evoke? And then when I read Michael's paper, uh, my question was uh, essentially answered um, and that he includes safe cities as basically the way of becoming smart cities. Um, but in terms of the difference I saw between these two, you know, safe conjuring these ideas of police and trying to bring down crime rates and then smart ultimately being convenience and then what we are witnessing this uh, rise of the inclusion of AI. Then I also thought that including the internet and uh, specifically the ability of people to act freely online uh, and offline as part of this uh, overarching narrative of civil liberties, I thought that was actually um, a refreshing stance in that the public sphere as such um, has changed and media itself has changed. Um, and then I think that uh, relating to some of the comments made um, during the author presentations, this question of is China a mass exporter of authoritarianism? Uh, I think they both authors are trying to remind us that the source of the technology does not necessarily determine how and for what it's going to be used. Mm -hmm. Technology in itself, I don't think is necessarily authoritarian or democratic, but the way in which it is applied is going to determine whether it's authoritarian or democratic. And the fact then that both authors point out that there is this lack of public participation in the implementation of these technologies, uh, that's where the worry begins. And uh, as Michael in his presentation said, the rate at which these technologies are spreading is incredibly worrying. And I think it relates directly to that, um, not including the public in, in the implementation of these technologies that essentially revolve around them I think it's a dangerous idea and very much in direct opposition to the idea of democracy and popular sovereignty. And then I also think that um, an element that came through is this involvement of the private sphere. And I think that is quite significant um, because for them, the implementation of the tech, for the, for the private sphere, the implementation of, of these technologies uh, is neutral. They, they're not on the side of democracy or authoritarianism necessarily, but their main interest is um, profit and where they can benefit from. Um, in Michael's paper, I did pick up something that I find quite significant. Um, the description of these databases and uh, intelligence operation centers as surveillance nerves, I thought, this is important terminology. Um, it's essentially biological and clinical almost, and it used, used to describe living things. So for me, this gets me to think about what are the abilities that we are giving technologies? Um, are we taking decision-making power out of the hands of human beings and putting it into these technologies, You know, trusting them implicitly? And then uh, just the last idea for me, 
from both papers is what does this tell us about how the nature of the state's power is shifting? So with surveillance technologies, uh, Michael points out that uh, people tend to conform to the status quo when they know they're being watched. And there's this very um, Foucauldian idea of panopticism where the state doesn't have to necessarily exercise this direct power, but places these visible reminders of it all around and creates these mute kind of autopiloted uh, subjects. Um, yeah, once again, I think both authors, both authors uh, did very well and uh, I really enjoyed these papers and I do hope all our participants do read these. Thanks, Isabel. Um, that's great. Um, before I forget, um, everyone, there's, there is an evaluation form in the chat. Um, and Dumi just posted it. Um, and we'd be super grateful if you could, you could just kind of add your evaluation of, of the event. Um, and we'll use that to tailor it, you know, kind of future events. So um, we, have, we have a little bit more than 20 minutes for, um, for question and answer. Um, and um, I, I see that there is some some questions in, in the chat. Please add more if, if any if, if you have any questions. I'm I'm going to kick off with a question to to all of the all of the respondents. Um, you know, um, Johanna made the, the point that you know that that there's no way of looking at, at the issue of of the impact of, of Chinese influence on African agency without historicizing it. And you know, as we, we we're seeing some some indications now of, of significant shifts in the China Africa relationship. So, for example. For example, the, um, there's been repeated mentions from different research groups that there's, that there's, a, there's been a significant decline um, in, in Chinese uh, bilateral funding um, for project funding, particularly, and this, this particularly relates to the China Exim Bank and the China Development Bank. At the same time, we're also seeing like, mu like much enhanced um, activity in Africa from different Chinese corporate actors. Um, so for example, you know, just, just, a, just a random example, um, the Chinese uh, company Transian um, is you know is, is, is now one of the has a, is now one of the largest mobile phone sellers in the world um, without doing much business in in China at all um, on the back of selling selling affordable um, smartphones and feature phones to African consumers um, and in the process. Um, they, they managed to then also leverage that into, into starting Africa's largest music streaming business. Um, and in the process, they, they managed to, to, to gather so many kind of like legal rights for African music that they now have the largest repository of legal African music in, of anyone in the world. So, you know, so the, the, this, this is a development that happened over the last, the last few years. So if, if you, when you look at, at this issue of agency, not only state agency, but also social agency, how do you see it develop over the next 10 years? Like what, what is, what is Africa, Africa, China agency going to look like in 2030? Um, why, don't, why don't we start with, with Johanna and, you know, kind of, you know, kind of um, go around, around the horn um, and just, just give your, some of your ideas. That's such a brilliant question, Kobus. Why did you have to start with me? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, from the perspective um, of, of this loan diplomacy stuff that I've been looking at, and I mean, it, it's not just in the DRC, it's been also Ghana and Angola. I definitely see, uh, I mean, as we all know, as, as you say, China's overall lending has dropped and it's dropped dramatically. And I think mm. it's also a matter of China's risk aversion. So China, um, China powered agency, as I define it, as it defined by you know the availability of Chinese loans or investments in that way, is definitely not going to look like that anymore because China's policy, you know, China's foreign policy has changed, and I don't see it going back to the kind of you know grand kind of projects, risk averse, where China does things that nobody else does in Africa in terms of lending. Um, we know that they now ask, I mean, the banks ask for more feasibility studies. They put, uh, you know, when it comes to that second or third tranche of something, um, the banks might just put it on hold. So I do think that it's going to be more modest, this kind of um, using China to play other actors off each other. I definitely don't see that changing um, in 2030. Um, thank you. Um, Eugenio, how, how does it look from your perspective? Uh, well, I, it's difficult to predict anything, even like two months, but, uh, but uh, 
it seems that uh, I go back to how you introduce our panel. You know, I, I think that the shift from uh, the state high level relationship to the level of individuals is not just how we frame this event, uh, but it's something that is happening in dramatic ways. And uh, we see how Facebook is much more relevant than US foreign policy in Africa uh, by you know, a very large amount. Uh, so much is uh, you know, Google and the others. Uh, and so much so that agents like Google and Facebook who, who sort of uh, um, um, didn't show interest in the infrastructural component of the information society now are uh, laying down the largest uh, undersea cable uh, around the continent. And, uh, and so what it seems to be happening is a shifting towards a more granular and uh, more difficult to identify way to uh, impose certain ways of being or for the time being uh, trying to extract value and extract information from, uh, from citizens, from users uh, that can be then used uh, at a later stage in ways that are unpredictable. And, uh, and the, 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 the concern there, and uh, as you've seen from my presentation, I try to say, well, we shouldn't uh, support moral panics and, uh, and so forth, but uh, there is a, a, a real uh, um, movement in a direction of uh, uh, smaller players, less visible players, uh, extracting elements from individuals in ways that can be counteracted uh, only by a form of mass mobilization. And uh, will this happen? I don't think so. Uh, should this happen? Probably so. And we have the like of Tim Barnes-Lee, inventor of the World Wide Web, uh, trying to sort of not just claim that the internet as it is, is a corruption of the ideal that emerged from the Silicon Valley, you know, back in the 60s and then more in the 90s when it becomes a global phenomenon, but also providing kind of a technical way to make that happen. And uh, Joe Biden trying to, 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 to show uh, uh, interest in possibly uh, using antitrust as we use with the oil companies back in the, in the 19th century. And interestingly, and I would love to hear what you, Kobus, and others think, uh, similar uh, pressures coming on uh, Alibaba from the Chinese government uh, and uh, sort of trying to reassert its uh, power over a man that has become too popular to be sort of reined back uh, into like the corporate state coalition uh, that uh, might uh, allow the state uh, to make use of what is being extracted by, by corporate agents. So it's a very complicated scenario and that requires a form of mobilization that is from the bottom up rather than simply like reports or like other agents saying, uh, we should be aware of China, things might be a bit dodgy. And, uh, and uh, it, it's, it's likely to get more pervasive and more scary over time. And the solutions are maybe it can be found in a book of science fiction rather than uh, in political manifestos. Um, you know, Jean Pierre, um, looking at you know, it's, it's one thing to look at to look at this this kind of discussion of um, you know of, of Chinese power and, and, and its presence from Africa, uh, from a continental African perspective. Of it, it's it's somewhat different from your perspective in Hong Kong. Um, you know, where, where like how, how do you see this develop? Well, um, uh, uh, as we know, uh, China is not a unitary uh, actor. There are many uh, actors, uh, Chinese actors, operating uh, in Africa. Uh, it is uh, uh, including countries which like, like uh, Djibouti are rather authoritarian. Actually, uh, you have the embassy, the government, then the SOEs, then some private access. There is some coordination when there are big plans to be, uh, you know, introduced or carried out. But but still, uh, one thing which has uh, struck me uh, in the case of uh, Djibouti, uh, but, but uh, is the uh, agency uh, developed by a big company like China Merchant. China Merchants is uh, it's a large company, but it has its own uh, strategy, and uh, which doesn't go against the interest of uh, the Chinese state, uh, so to speak. But uh, there are a lot of things we and negotiations behind those though we don't know much about. Um, and Djibouti and and, and uh, China Merchant, just to take this example, uh, has managed to uh, develop many of its activities actually. Uh, 
uh, international activities uh, in a very autonomous way, and and very much so from the uh, branch um, established in Hong Kong actually, uh, because it's easier to develop activities from here. So uh, to go back to the you know the, what, what uh, was said by Eugenio um, uh, about Ali, Alibaba. Uh, yes, the, the US government, the Communist Party is trying to sort of rein in the big companies, uh, also fight against the monopolies they've developed to some degree. Uh, but at the same time, they're very cautious not to, well, no, 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 not to kill the golden goose because uh, Alibaba is a golden goose. If you look at the, I mean, to take this example, the, the fine Alibaba was uh, asked to pay 2.8 billion US dollar is just less than four percent of its uh, annual uh, annual um, uh, 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 income. So it's uh, uh, again there is, a, there is a very complex uh, situation here. Now, as far as China and other players are concerned in Africa, uh, I think we 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 are already moving for the reason indicating by Joanna, but also you know the the, the fact that the BRIs. Uh, is kind of scaled, has been scaled down, uh, the debt issue, uh, and, and the fact that China has burnt its, uh, its uh, fingers in a number of countries, not only in Africa, if you take the example of Venezuela, Ecuador, and, or other countries, or, or even Pakistan, uh, you know, uh, I don't think that China is going to get back many, much of uh, all of its money uh, invested there. So, so loans has been a way of promoting SOEs, Chinese, big Chinese companies for some time. Uh, whether it's going to be replaced, which has already been some, somewhat the case in the DRC by uh, investments, uh, is the trend which is favored by the government actually, you know, to, to sort of, uh, including by the Chinese government, to, to move to productive investments rather than to keep giving, providing loans to, uh, you know, help African countries building infrastructures, uh, uh, infrastructure built by Chinese companies with Chinese workers. I mean, that's the old model, which is which is changing as well. So, so, and then I, I see other other countries, other groups of nations like the European Union, or the U.S. and others, uh, or India, uh, also getting into the same uh, uh, kind of. Um, you know, uh, 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 competing more with the Chinese companies in the coming years. I think um, that has been, uh, and, and as a reaction of uh, you know of China's uh, larger footprint and and the geopolitical consequences it can have for 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 the other players uh, in Africa. Even if if I may just add one word is about the, you know, the new Cold War you've mentioned. What is interesting is Africa has tried to as much as possible succeeded in a way. To, re, to stay outside of the new Cold War, you know, to continue to uh, cooperate and to do business with both you know, China and the West. And uh, for the time being, it has worked. Uh, maybe it won't work everywhere, depending on the, you know, how, 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 how those big countries are involved in, in, in some part of, of Africa when, when that's a strategic interest uh, uh, in, in uh, um, uh, conflicting with each other. But, but so uh, even, in, even in Djibouti, I mean, it's amazing I may, and here may, I may have sort of evolved uh, I mean, with my uh, initial view about this competition, but great power there. Uh, it's amazing how um, great power, including Djibouti, has tried to keep some kind of peaceful, peaceful coexistence uh, and then to minimize the tensions among each other uh, because they, they need to be there and they don't want to, uh, you know, to, to jeopardize their presence in Djibouti. Um, thanks, uh, Michael. You know, for, like as as, as Jean Pierre mentioned, you know this this kind of back and forth about uh, like you know ICT and, and 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 technology is particularly kind of fraught area in um, in this larger discussion of you know kind of 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 African agency, but then also this this kind of related discussion of, of, you know, kind of who has the most influence on the continent, you know, kind of as, as it increasingly becomes framed in, in this kind of Cold War framing. Um, how is that looking from your perspective in the US um, and, and how do you see it developing over the next few years? Yeah, um, okay, so I want to um, bring in like a, a more uh, big picture, um, you know, kind of empirical data point. And this is from uh, Sean Stars, who's a political economist 
and his PhD was overseen by Leo Panich. Um, he's also uh, worked quite a bit um, with Chomsky, Noam Chomsky. Um, so he's been vetted. His work has been vetted by some great experts. And um, uh, this is an update. Uh, so he, he has a, an interesting essay worth reading called something like uh, American Power Hasn't um, Declined, It's Globalized. And he's talking about the limitations of looking at GDP as a, uh, uh, a measure of national economic dominance. And um, what, he, what he does is, is he says, you know, well, look, um, uh, a lot of uh, production in, in manufacturing and um, investment and so on has globalized. So we have to look at this a little bit differently. And he looks at the, the Forbes, you know, two, top 2000 co international corporations. And um, he, this is, so this is updated data. This is from an email he sent to me, uh, 2020 data. Um, um, so for IT and software services, US profit share is 76% versus China 10%. For technology, hardware, and equipment, U.S. is 63% versus China's 6%. Um, more than Taiwan's 5.7%, uh, but nowhere near uh, South Korea's 14%, and less than Japan's 7.9%. Electronics, U.S. is 43%, Japan 15%, Taiwan 12%, South Korea 12%, China 10%. So China has increased its profit share by over 300%. Um, since uh, his, his earlier data that we were talking about. But um, U.S. has also increased, and China is still only fifth highest profit share in the world in 2020, um, after being the largest electronics exporter continuously from 2004. And I have an article that I just published at, at Roar, Roar Mag R -O -A -R, uh, Magazine um, on digital colonialism. And what I was getting at um, earlier is just that if you look in general, um, the United States takes most, not all, and not exclusively, but they take most of the high tech sector and the knowledge and information economy. They're overwhelmingly domin dominant, especially once you start disaggregating outside of both U.S. and Chinese borders. And so the um, issue here then is um, there's no real parity. And that's something that needs to be understood in, as an empirical fact. And um, I think more generally, uh, the issue is what kind of world do we want to live in? So Eugenio brought up um, uh, uh, Tim Berners-Lee's project to you know, have data pods that uh, basically would allow people to host their own data and give companies access out. It's one way of doing a decentralization of the internet. Freedom Box is another one where everybody has a little personal server and those are products that came out of the free and open source software market. I wrote a paper for Right to Know campaign called People's Tech for People's Power. And it goes through a lot of different alternatives. Um, but at the end of the day, um, we have a system in which is uh, built towards endless and limitless growth. We have an unequal exchange and division of labor where in Africa, you still see an extraction and export oriented economy where some people dig in the dirt for metal, some people pick off coffee beans and harvest crops, that's their role that was assigned to them in the colonial and post-colonial world. It's still their role today because the rich countries have evolved and they dominate the high-tech sector. One way, if we were a halfway sane human species, <laughs> what we'd be trying to do is bring up the standard of living of the poorest people in the world as fast as we as humanly possible, reduce the standard of living of the rich and uh, to some extent the middle class because of the growth crisis. And here I'm relying on degrowth literature. And one way to do that is to start transferring technology and knowledge and reorienting our way of life. So that's obviously a big thing, but um, you know this is a very much, uh, if we're gonna live through a situation in which the United States and China are going at it for market share. Not saying that there's parity there, but just saying that like if that's the dominant modality and intellectual property and all that kind of stuff is maintained by those who are able, who are benefiting from it, 
as private property and seeking out profit and growth. Competition, antitrust was brought up. Antitrust at the end of the day is about competitive capitalism. If we can't get past this, then we're going to, by the time as the climate is heating up, as we're collapsing ecosystems, I think that's the framework we have to look at this and try to um, think about a fundamentally different high-tech economy. Thank you. That's that's a great that's a great point to to end on. I think um, we've we've run out of time, um, and um, so I just like to to thank everyone for for attending. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very I'm very always very like one has to kind of just thank people for their attention because you know it's it's hard one um, and hard earned. Um, and um, so um, I wanted to thank all of our speakers. Um, you're an amazing you're an amazing group, and your work provided such kind of contrasting perspectives on on, on this issue. Um, we really hope to be taking this forward um, and to do more work on on on, on this issue of, of agency um, and unpacking the, the concept of agency further um, was, it was in the, the framing of China-Africa relations. Um, so I just uh, would, um, yeah, I would just like to thank everyone at SAI for, for arranging this and, and, uh, and again to everyone for, for attending and to all of the speakers. Thanks so much and have a fantastic day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, Corpus. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.